With the success of both Spider-Man 1 and 2, Sony began work on the sequel in order to match the emotional core of the last two films. Director Sam Raimi found it important to push Peter Parker to his emotional limits, revisiting his past guilt and taking him on a journey of forgiveness. However, Sony had a completely different plan for the sequel, prioritizing merchandise and fan service over telling a compelling story. As a result, Spider-Man 3 was messy and lacked focus. Despite this, the film was a massive financial success and introduced many elements that people still remember the film for. However, during the film's early development, what elements never made it into the final film and was it a good idea to cut them out of the movie? Venom was never intended to be the villain of Spider-Man 3, as Sam Raimi felt that he lacked humanity. Nonetheless, producers basically guilt trip Raimi to add Venom to the film. Despite this hindrance, Raimi did his best to do justice to this iconic character. While artists were creating multiple concepts for Venom, other teams were experimenting with out-of-the-box and practical ways to bring Venom to life. Among these teams was Frontline Design, who created this life-sized Venom animatronic that was not only menacing, but also incredibly comic accurate. This animatronic was used during very early screen tests for Spider-Man 3, evident in these behind-the-scenes test photos. Interestingly, this animatronic did make it into the film, as it can be seen in this rare unreleased trailer. Now you might be sitting there wondering to yourself, That's a good question, and there's a very simple explanation for that. According to special effects artist Steve Johnson, animatronics may look amazing on film, but you run into the problem of having to constantly maintain them, and since it's incredibly hard to film them due to their limited movement, it was much easier and cheaper to replace them with a practical suit and digital model. While the animatronic model didn't work out in the end, there was still plenty of concepts that artists were experimenting with. Some of the concepts embraced Venom's alien appearance. The designs were terrifying and seemed like something you'd see out of a cosmic horror. I love how far back the eyes could stretch and how you could see the veins through its almost translucent skin. It really emphasized that a symbiote was an independent living creature. You may notice that the symbiote is purple instead of black in multiple concepts. This is because Sam Raimi and the crew took major influence from Ultimate Spider-Man, whose Venom also took on a purple color scheme. It seems this purple aesthetic was quite popular during the conceptual stages. Not only did it make its way into a plethora of other concepts, such as this one by artist Constantine Sekaris, but it was also included in early costume tests, an animatronic bust, and pieces of early merchandise. There were other interesting designs for Venom. Some, let's just say, drifted too far from the source material. But hey, I've always been a supporter of unique character redesigns, but only when they're good. Luckily, most of the concepts were much more comic accurate, such as this one, which leans into Venom's disgusting, grotesque appearance. As you sort through the catalog of Venom's varying designs, you may notice one glaring detail. The illustrators seem to love illustrating Venom as much slimmer than he appears in the comics. Well, there's a very simple explanation for this. According to artist Constantine Sekaris, Venom's design needed to be practical. Since the illustrations would be converted into a foam suit for the actors to wear, it was important that the suit wouldn't be too restrictive. The bigger Venom was, the less overall movement the wearer of the suit would have. What Sam still wanted was Eddie Brock uh, inside that suit. He didn't, uh, you know, he wants his actor. Because of the limitations that a practical approach would lend to Venom's design, the focus shifted from a more monstrous appearance to something that was more humanoid and grounded. The first order of business was to emphasize the symbiote's potential for body horror and mutilation. According to illustrator E.J. Kreiser, Sam Raimi wanted Venom's design to feel tense, to elicit a sense of unbridled rage and ferocity. As a result, many of the concepts are incredibly intense. You can see how the symbiote is pulling on Eddie's skin with such force that it even dislocates his thumb. It's almost as if the symbiote has replaced his muscles and tendons entirely. 
some of the concepts take this intensity even farther. Take a look at this sculpture, which demonstrates the symbiote's ability to grotesquely alter the human form. Eddie's skin appears to be bubbling and rotting away. The symbiote has painfully fused with his skin to transform him into a disgusting monstrosity. The symbiote appears to have completely corrupted Eddie's body in these sculptures, transforming him into an unpredictable and vicious ghoul. However, you can still tell that he's enjoying his newfound power and dangerous form. This model of Eddie Brock's skeleton perfectly demonstrates how intense the symbiote's bonding process was. Painfully, his skull has been warped to the point it no longer resembles a human skeleton. This skull was used in the original ending for Spider-Man 3, revealing how Venom had already killed Eddie when they first bonded. It was deleted, however, because test audiences found it too dark and disturbing. This is something else. Spider-Man's black suit is probably the most iconic visual element of Spider-Man 3, but there was a slight chance we could have gotten something completely different. This design right here was used during early costume tests. As you can see, the costume was much more glossy and was devoid of any silver webbing. Interestingly, they seem to be testing out many Spider logo designs. As for why Sam Raimi never used this look in the end, well, I think this image perfectly explains why. There wasn't much differences when it comes to Sandman and Harry's designs. For Sandman, it seems Raimi already had a good grasp of how the character would look. So many of the concepts don't drift too far from his final appearance, and there's only slight changes in attire. For Harry, the differences mostly relate to his appearance. Some concepts either illustrated Harry wearing a simple jacket or a full body black bodysuit. In this concept by E.J. Kreiser, Harry's jacket looks a bit more complex and visually striking. However, many would say that it's over designed and too busy. As you can see from these two concepts, Harry was equipped with a singular black visor. It seems this visor prop did actually make it into the film, as it can be seen in this early production photo. However, for unknown reasons, it was later scrapped in favor of the full body face mask. While Sam Raimi was forced to add Venom into the film, it's always interesting to see what other villains were considered during the film's development. In the original inception of Spider-Man 3, the Vulture would have served as the film's primary antagonist. His role in the story would have been that of a revenge story, where he would try to kill Spider-Man after he threw him in jail. Seems that Raimi was dead set on adding Vulture to the film. Not only did the production team create these two sets of concept arts, but a set of prototype wings were also created for the film. However, the wings were later scrapped after Vulture was cut from the movie. During Spider-Man 3's development, artist Constantine Sekiris created this concept art of the lizard. Now if the lizard was ever considered for the film is unknown, but since the artist also created lizard concepts for Spider-Man 2, we can safely assume that the artist just really wanted to see lizard in live action. We did receive several other pieces of concept art for the film, and some detailed entirely unused sequences and plot beats. Like in these concepts, that appear to show Sandman robbing a bank with a golden vault, or these concepts that show him creating a sandcastle for his daughter, which did make it into a deleted scene. In this concept, Spider-Man is shown swinging to save Gwen Stacy in her sports car instead of MJ inside of a taxi. Other concepts just featured slightly different variations of sets, locations, and Goblin's weapons. Hate those things. Interestingly, according to this concept, creatives toiled with the idea of setting Spider-Man 3 during the winter time, which I think would have added some visual flair to the film. It's true that most concepts never made it into the final film, but it's always interesting to look back at the early conceptions to many designs, sets, and villains.